Dan, do you want to introduce um, the speaker today? Sure. Yeah. So Lewis uh, is a longtime friend of ours and friend of 50 years. Um, he got his uh, PhD in biochemistry from, from Duke, where he, uh, his studies uh, were at the intersection of uh, enzymology, lipid biochemistry, and bacterial membrane biogenesis. He then got his postdoc at UCSF, um, where he focused on uh, protein X-ray crystallography to look at enzyme structure and function. And then he went to Novartis, the evil empire. Am I allowed to say that, Louis? For <laughs> Maybe not. You don't have. No. It's okay. You don't have to. For six years, um, uh, and where he focused on uh, protein chemistry tech um, to look for new uh, new therapeutics. And then at, since 2018, he was the chief science officer at a company called Tierra Biosciences. Uh, a 50 years portfolio company doing really, really cool things, helping develop a cell free system uh, to bioprospect for novel natural, um, uh, 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 novel chemical matter. Um, and he recently co founded two stealth startups, very mysterious, Lewis, very mysterious indeed. Um, so we often hear uh, you know, that DNA is the code of life. Um, and as software runs on computers, DNA runs uh, in our cells. Um, but this, of course, isn't uh, precisely accurate. Uh, and today, uh, Lewis is going to explain where and how this analogy uh, breaks down. And so with that, uh, Lewis, take it away. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Seth and Ayla, for, uh, uh, um, and Kayla, for having me. I uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, I've known about Impact Tech uh, and been you know, involved since, I think, 2015. And uh, it's, really, it's really amazing to see what uh, the team has put together and how 50 years has grown and Impact Tech has, has grown. And uh, it's been a, a force for good in the Bay Area biotech scene. So uh, it's my pleasure to present. Uh, bioengineering is not programming. Um, it's meant to be a, a provocative title. Uh, it has a, a hidden subtitle, which is embrace the, uh, embrace the complexity. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll delve into a little of that complexity as we go forward. Um, this will be a two-part seminar, so 30 minutes roughly. Uh, then an intermission, another 30 minutes. Uh, and if you could hold your uh, questions uh, to the end, uh, I have quite a bit of material to get through, uh, but I will stay as long as I need to to answer questions. And then we'll also have breakout rooms. Uh, a few disclaimers. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce you to aspects of how information is stored and transmitted in biology. And it's just a appetizer uh, because any one of the topics uh, deserves its own seminar. It, it's really complex. Uh, cartoons will sometimes be used to convey certain complex biochemistry. Uh, they do not show relative scales. I think that's important. Uh, the intended audience are uh, people who are biocurious, uh, not necessarily professional biologists. So if you are a professional biologist, this might be a review for you. Uh, and I do mention some companies in this talk uh, that I think are doing interesting work, uh, but they're not necessarily endorsed by me by 50 years or by Impact Tech, uh, and I don't have financial stake in these companies. So, uh, binary code, ones and zeros. Uh, at first glance, I think that uh, if you're looking at uh, DNA code, uh, where it's G's, C's, A's, and T's, uh, although I see a, a Y in this, so I made a typo. <laughs> see if you can find it. Uh, uh, you know, they're, at, at, at first glance, they look like they encode the same type of information with the same depth. But what I want to show you today is that, yes, you can store information that you would in binary code in DNA code, uh, but, you, but DNA code really uh, is a set of commands that that informs chemistry and, and the code itself has chemistry. And so that's what I want to talk about and show you. Uh, and then you can see all the complexity in manipulating this code. So you may remember from Biology 101, the central dogma, uh, which is classically that DNA is the permanent code that lets uh, uh, organisms uh, pass along essentially inherited replicating chemistry from one organism to another through evolution uh, and over time. Uh, that DNA permanent code uh, is used to make uh, temporary uh, um, copies of information in the form of RNA. Uh, this RNA uh, is turned into proteins uh, and uh, amino acid strings essentially that fold up on themselves. Uh, these proteins uh, both provide the structure of organisms and also catalyze the chemistry that 
builds an organism and sustains its biochemistry. And so, so this, is, this is sort of a simplistic view of it, uh, but I want to show you today that uh, it's much, much more complicated than this. And in that complexity, uh, there's great opportunity uh, in terms of precisely manipulating biology, and that this is going to be uh, something that humanity does more and more of uh, going forward. So uh, I apologize for showing you a little chemistry. Uh, chemistry is, I think, often not well taught, so people recoil when they're shown chemical structures, but I think it's, it's instructive in this case, uh, and uh, it helps, I think, helps you appreciate uh, uh, the information encoded chemically in DNA. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, the anatomy of a, of a single unit of DNA is a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Now, the sugar and the phosphate are, are in very, you know, they don't vary. Uh, they form, uh, if you look over here, sort of this uh, cartoonish uh, light blue backbone uh, of DNA. But the bases vary, uh, and at every repeating unit of DNA, uh, there can be an A, T, G, or C. Uh, thiamine, guanine, adenine, or cytosine. Um, but what I want to show you the chemistry, uh, the reason I want to show you the chemistry is to show that these backbones remain constant, but if you look at the bases, thiamines and adenines form two hydrogen bonds between them. So it's, it's just a chemical way in which things are stuck together, making use of, of some specific chemistry and, and specific atom types. Oops. Uh, Likewise, guanine and cytosine pair to each other. And uh, if you notice, there's three hydrogen bonds between these two. And, and this is actually the first insight, uh, which is that uh, DNA is, is sticky uh, and uh, the bases form complementary pairs in most cases. And what I've done is shown, these, uh, shown hydrogen bonds as uh, little dots. So there's two dots between A's and T's, uh, three dots between G's and C's. And uh, DNA normally exists uh, in two anti-parallel strands, uh, which usually but not always form uh, a typical uh, helix. And uh, the helix you know, is composed of these two strands uh, with these, these matched base pairs. And so when you look at uh, uh, DNA uh, you know, just on, as letters on paper, uh, you really need to know that it has structure, and, uh, and this structure uh, has relevance uh, to the biology that it encodes, and we'll go into the, more of this later. Now, RNA, which is the temporary copy made from DNA, uh, I'm going to show you a bit more chemistry because it's very, very similar to DNA. Uh, it has a sugar phosphate uh, invari you know, invariant uh, uh, unit, uh, but then it has a variable base. Um, in this case, it's cytosine, guanine, adenine, uh, uh, and uracil instead of thiamine. So one of the bases is different. Uh, instead of A and T in DNA, it's A and U uh, that pair uh, in RNA. So when DNA is turned into RNA, which I'll discuss more in a moment, um, uh, uh, the copy of RNA that's made has uh, a slightly different uh, but a complementary uh, base census. Also, because of these subtle differences in chemistry, uh, RNA adopts different structures than DNA. And this is a really important point that we'll go over uh, and look at the applications of this later in the talk. So RNA uh, is sometimes, but not always, uh, a single helix, uh, but it can fold up on itself, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and so uh, you know, RNA uh, interacts with itself uh, like DNA does, but in a different way that's modulated by its different chemistry. So just to highlight, DNA and RNA are very similar. The backbones are very similar, but uh, RNA has a hydroxyl uh, on its sugar uh, that DNA lacks. Um, DNA and RNA have similar base pairs, but one of them, uh, thiamine in DNA, is uracil uh, in RNA. And so, these small chemical differences uh, probably seem trivial, uh, but they're, they're actually not. Uh, they, they very much affect how DNA and RNA fold up uh, 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 in an aqueous environment, which is where life happens. So 
A very complex molecular machinery takes the permanent template of DNA and turns it into RNA. And this process is called transcription. And uh, I show this, the, the, the proteins and enzymes that do this as a blob right here, uh, but it's actually a complex piece of uh, proteinaceous machinery, uh, which you can see uh, over on the right side in this blue and, and, and purple structure, uh, is an RNA polymerase uh, unwinding DNA and, and making RNA from it. And so, you know, what this, what this molecular machine does is it peels open uh, a piece of DNA and it produces an RNA uh, that's complementary to one of the strands of the DNA. And so this is how a temporary message that we'll call messenger RNA is made from a piece of DNA. Now, uh, as a little aside, um, this process, as you imagine, is important in biology because you know, DNA makes RNA, which makes protein, uh, which keeps cells uh, you know, growing and, and working. Uh, so if you inhibit RNA polymerase, bad things happen. So RNA synthesis actually uh, indirectly, well, or directly, depending on how you look at it, played uh, a role in a specific war, uh, one of the first uh, world wars, uh, the War of Austrian Succession uh, that started in Europe but spread to European colonies uh, the world over in the 1700s. And this was because uh, a, uh, a German emperor, uh, Charles VI, um, did not have sons uh, and tried to arrange uh, uh, his empire being succeeded uh, by women instead of, uh, or his daughter instead of a son. Uh, and he hadn't quite finished the preparations for this when uh, he had a, uh, a large meal of mushrooms. And those mushrooms uh, were probably contaminated with death cat mushrooms. And uh, these uh, are very poisonous, and they contain a molecule called alpha amantitin. And uh, this molecule actually binds to RNA polymerase, uh, this, this uh, protein machinery that makes RNA from DNA. Uh, and one of, its, uh, one of the first things it does is cause liver failure uh, because uh, so much um, uh, biochemistry is happening in one's liver. So that's what happened to Charles VI, uh, and he died uh, unexpectedly uh, before entirely wrapping up uh, his succession plans. And uh, this led to uh, a global conflict uh, and one of the first truly global conflicts. So uh, just an interesting aside about biochemistry and history. Now we've made RNA, uh, this messenger RNA, which I, I told you about a few slides ago. Now, how does this RNA become protein? Well, this is actually very interesting because uh, a given piece of RNA uh, has three base pair uh, words, as it were. Um, and each word, uh, each codon, we'll call the word, uh, encodes uh, uh, an amino acid. An amino acid is the basic building blocks of proteins. Uh, and so basically in this table that you see on the right, uh, you see something very interesting is that you see these three letter words uh, that encode uh, a given amino acid. And there's, there's 20 amino acids typically, uh, there's actually sometimes more. Uh, but what you'll see right away is that there's degeneracy in this code. So there's you know, six different uh, words that, that uh, encode the amino acid leucine. And uh, on the other hand, um, there's only two codons uh, that encode cysteine, another amino acid. And each of these, each of these names corresponds to one of these amino acids. Uh, and an amino acid is just you know, the minimal building block of a protein. And so from a messenger RNA, this huge uh, piece of protein and RNA molecular machinery called a ribosome um, uh, recruits Coda, re recruits tRNA, which is another type of RNA, uh, that is attached to an amino acid, and it catalyzes uh, the transfer of these amino acids, or the attachment of these amino acids to each other in a linear form that's encoded by the messenger RNA. And so this growing uh, uh, bead, uh, string of beads uh, here uh, represents a growing polypeptide that's encoded by this messenger RNA. And uh, each tRNA is attached to uh, a particular amino acid, as is summarized in this table, 
and you can see that this piece of mRNA encodes a peptide that uh, is these, consists of these five amino acids. So there are 64 codons, but there's only 24 amino acids. So one interesting insight is that the code is degenerate. Peptides, as I mentioned, are strings of amino acids. What, what, di what differentiates one amino acid from another? Well, if you see, uh, when we look at this anatomy of amino acids, the important thing to note here is that the black, blue, and green parts of each of these basic building blocks of proteins is the same. However, uh, the, um, the red portion uh, represents a different side chain. So it's a different part of each amino acid uh, that's chemically unique. And each of these side chains confer different properties on that part of the protein. And so if you imagine a string of these, you can see that there's, uh, you know, there's many combinatorial possibilities. Uh, for instance, just for a short peptide of, of five amino acids, there's 3.2 million uh, possible combinations. Uh, now, in, in reality, uh, they're not evenly distributed. Uh, the, you know, the probability isn't evenly distributed, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, as pro peptides are made, um, but there's, there's, there's room for significant, for vast evolutionary, evolutionary diversity uh, one, when building polypeptide strings. So, Proteins are peptides that are folded up on themselves. And depending on which of these red groups uh, are on each uh, amino acid at each position, uh, these polypeptide strings will fold onto themselves differently. So sometimes they make helices, uh, protein helices. So we see helices often in nature. Sometimes they make sheets, uh, beta sheets. And these structures uh, including helices and sheets, uh, can have kinks in them and basically bend around each other. So this is called a tertiary structure of a protein. Uh, and then multiple proteins can themselves assemble into supermolecular machinery. And this would be a, a hemoglobin monomer, uh, the oxygen-carrying protein in, in blood, uh, now forming uh, a tetramer. And so there's all these levels of organization uh, uh, in each peptide that's encoded by RNA, that's encoded by DNA. And so uh, I, what I'm trying to emphasize is there's a great deal of structure that is derived from uh, a primary uh, sequence of, of letters. Now, enzymes are particular types of proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. And this is, this is really uh, the business end of life. Uh, so the diversity of amino acids that can be used to build a protein means that there's numerous different types of proteins that have evolved. This protein here is shown uh, just in a surface rendering, and it's colored uh, by the charge. Uh, blue is positive, uh, red is electronegative, uh, grayish is, is, is neutral um, over the surface of this protein. So how these amino acid side chains uh, are arranged and how the protein folds up determines things like the charge uh, on its surface. Uh, and this charge affects what chemistry the protein does, what other proteins it sticks to, what other small molecules it sticks to, and a whole array of other properties. But this information is encoded in the DNA. And uh, inside, inside the surface rendering, uh, we can render the same protein uh, in this uh, ribbon diagram, and these ribbons just trace the backbone of the polypeptide chain without showing the side chains uh, because uh, it would look very busy. But one can, one can look at specific side chains in this polypeptide and, you know, and see interesting things uh, such as uh, you know, non-adjacent uh, side chains can have, uh, can be, side chains from non-adjacent amino acids can in fact be adjacent uh, when a peptide is folded up. So uh, there's this, this whole, whole level of, of complexity in protein folding uh, that's, that's also encoded in biology. So biology's central dogma is that you know, DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. Proteins do chemistry and structurally make up cells. Cells make up organisms. Um, but it's actually not that simple.